Hello and welcome to Size Giver Visual Languages of Measurement in Digital Space. My name is Angie from BSI and thank you for joining us. Quinn Quinn will be delivering this session today. We would like the session to be interactive as possible and welcome any questions that you may have via the Q&A function as your mics are muted. Simply click on the Q&A button and post your question. Questions will be answered by Karina at the end of the presentation. As a reminder, this session will be recorded. Karina is a lecturer in design at Goldsmiths University of London and has been working alongside BSI for the last few years. She's more recently collaborated with BSI to teach a project that explored creative ways to hack, re-image and subvert existing standards. Last November, Karina received the BSI Standards Awards for Education about Standardization, which recognised an exceptional contribution in integrating standards into university programmes and promoting student education projects. We're excited to have Corinne join us today, exploring the visual communications of size using everyday objects and the opportunities available to develop visual communications into standards. Over to you, Karina. Hi everyone. Um, so I'm Karina Quinn, and I'm, uh, um, as Angie said, I'm a designer and a lecturer at Goldsmiths University of London, and I currently co-lead the second year of our BA degree in design. This is our third year studio, which is sadly closed at the moment, and everyone's at home. We are a Post-disciplinary degree, we aren't defined by disciplines like product or graphic design, but we can move between and beyond these disciplines to respond to a rapidly changing world. We believe that design isn't just a way of making and doing, it's a way of understanding and engaging with the world and asking questions, and that's what I hope to do today. I'm really interested in standards in relation to design and creative practice. Standards design the boundaries of objects. They guide processes, behaviours and procedures. They define vocabularies and details which shape the world we live in. But they also affect us in, all, in everyday life and they have a human impact. And I'm interested in what does that look like? Today I'm going to take you through a research project of mine called SizeGiver. It's a visual archive of images which explores how online communities are innovating by creating informal standards and using everyday objects to communicate the size of something in a digital image. And I'm going to ask some questions with this, that this research poses, like what happens when standards are reappropriated for other unexpected uses? What role could online communities play as experts and could they contribute to future ways of standards making? And finally, in the age of the internet meme, I'll look at some creative visual ways to communicate. After the talk, I'll invite you to participate in some image making for this size giver archive by photographing some objects in your home, which you can Instagram to me or email to me to be part of the project. So here goes. A couple of years ago, I wrote a project for our Masters in Design Expanded Practice at Goldsmiths, which me and my colleague Ruby Hoet ran with the help of BSI Education and Dr Matthew Childs. The brief was called Standard Practice, here you can see an image of it, and it asked our design students to become aware of the various international standards associated with their design practices. Unless you're from the world of standards, standards um, are invisible, yet they shape the material world, systems and the things we interact with and design every day. So there's this enormous power within standards, especially in their ability to scale up and make a global impact. So for design, I think there's a huge creative potential in the way that standards are made, debated, written and described. Some standards, for example, guidelines on what constitutes feather or down, are so lyrical in their language and so beautifully illustrated. Or something that seems very boring, like the standard for how to boil pasta, is deconstructed into a meticulous and detailed set of actions. So to an outsider like me, standards are super interesting. In the project, students were encouraged to reimagine standards and hack them by appropriating their language and diagrams. 
or to be subversive with them in order to explore and open up the possibilities in their design practice. Because how often do we ever question the fundamentals of what we do in work or in life? Sometimes it's a good exercise to challenge the rules um, and change them. For instance, how would the design of garments, clothes, change if we got rid of sizing? And what would the knock-on effect be down the chain of production, distribution, packaging, advertising, even on coat hangers? In 1988, fashion designer Izumiaki developed his own sizing standard with his clothing line, Pleats Please. Um, all of the pieces in the collection were one size only and didn't conform to traditional sizing standards. The only size variations were in length as the garment could stretch up to four times its width. At the time, this is, was seen as a revolution in fashion design as it completely reimagined the way clothes were sized. Or how might you reimagine a standard dimension as a work of art? In 1913, Marcel Duchamp reimagined how long a metre could be in his artwork standard stoppages by dropping a metre length of string onto the floor and templating the curve it made when, he, when it fell. He created a version of the metre which was just a different shape. He made three of these new metres and turned them into wooden measuring tools. And he often called this project a joke about the metre. And really it's a challenge to standardisation itself and an invitation to reimagine the rules we live our lives by. There's also Le Corbusier's Modulator Man, a human standard in the shape of a six foot male body. Based on the principles of the golden ratio, Le Corbusier used this archetype body as a tool to design his spaces and architecture. This embodied standard could easily be subverted to design architecture for other types of bodies out of the average, or to undo and re-choreograph standard forms of movement. How, how might you invent and then standardize a ridiculous way of walking or a COVID-19 era handshake, for example? Standardized dimensions and modular systems also create unexpected relationships that unite objects through their dimensions. For example, this sculpture on the left by Joep van Nieshout came out of his chance realization that 12 Domelsch beer crates are exactly the same size as six concrete paving stones. He went on to create sculptures and furniture that explore this relationship. Now on the right, just click this, um, is an example of how chance dimensions can undo a product. Back in 2004, someone discovered that a kryptonite bicycle lock could be unlocked using the tube of a biro which led to a spate of bike thefts when the technique was put out online. So what other unexpected consequences or coincidences can standardization create? Um, related to standards and their descriptions, there's also the creative potential in following instructions with Yoko Ono's instructional art, a collection of directions to make and do things in a world that reads like poetry. So here, some really interesting examples of um, creative responses to standards. Coming back to the project though, students began by discovering standards, the standards involved in everyday objects. This particular student, Thomas Sandal, deconstructed a radio alarm clock to discover its component parts and their related ISOs. Um, these students on uh, the image on the left, Thomas and Lavinia, they reimagined the BMI scale at Boots to describe a spectrum of gender identity. And these other students on the right, Morgan and Molly, um, looked at the idea of remixing toy safety standards with beauty prosthetics like fake nails and eyelashes to create playful hybrid objects. The projects were later shown at the BSI conference in November 2018 in the Knowledge Marketplace. Maybe some of you saw them or chatted with the students. Um, the inspiration for the project brief really came from a book called The Neufert Architects Data. The book originates from the Nazi era German architect 
Ernst Neufert, who developed many processes of standardization in architecture and who was highly influenced by DIN 476 or the principles behind A4 paper. The book contains every possible dimension one could need to understand how objects, bodies and furniture react in, and interact within a spatial setting and provides a visual index of ideal dimensions. It's really the Bible for any architect or interior designer. And working for years as an interior designer, I often check, I would often check dimensions in the Neufert as I drew up floor plans and wonder if the standard human bodies were shaping the furniture within the book or vice versa. During the project, a student of mine showed me a meme from China. It was called A4 Waste, and it showed images posted by young women um, on Weibo, which is a Chinese social media site. Um, and they were measuring the torsos against an A4 sheet of paper to show how skinny they were. I found it really interesting how they weren't using a measuring tape, instead an object, a thing. Because um, A4 is an internationally known thing, and it definitely has more visual impact than a centimetre tape, at least on social media. So A4 Waste inspired me to search for more examples and to find other objects that are commonly used to communicate size and scale. Two years later, I've collected a visual archive of online photographs that use everyday objects to measure scale, and I call these objects size givers. So what is a size giver? A size giver is an object that's placed in a photograph to indicate size. It's usually a common mass produced object that is understood immediately. The most ordinary and recognized part-time model you know. The size giver is internationally known and has a tacit knowledge because everyone at home has some point held it in their hand. The size giver is a marker of reality in a digital image. People need size givers to make sense of the image of images in this stretchy, glitchy, pixelated terrain, a digital space. A photo of a prized pumpkin or the world's tiniest microchip would be unremarkable without the validation of a size giver. A size giver is like the scale bar on a city map or architect's plan, but in object form. You probably have one right now in your pocket, on your desk or in your kitchen cupboard. The size giver's value is in its ubiquitousness. It is standard, it is everywhere. It can be relied upon. This popularity also gives it cultural significance and meaning. The size giver is often used to validate another object in an image. This object object relationship can be straightforward like this image or uncanny and surreal. A lock of hair lies next to a penny. An AK-47 lies next to a ping pong ball. A can of coke illustrates a pile of rope. Would these objects have been put together under different circumstances if it wasn't for size giving? Some size givers have an actual British standard or ISO standard related to them. I spent some time in the BSI Knowledge Centre looking for them. This is a bottle cap, also known as BSEN 17177. And here it's shown illustrating a, an A on a slab of concrete or a piece of quartz on someone's countertop, a tiny pine cone, a solid shampoo bar, a mushroom in the wild, a push button component, or the thickness of a string of yarn. Coming back to the A4 paper, but no wastes this time, this is a piece of A4 measuring a, the density of wheat in a field component of a machine, 
uh, interesting sized and shaped rock, a child's kite, a bag for sale on eBay, some aquatic um, plants, and this is a can of Coke, ISO 10654, next to some unfired ceramics, um, illustrating a monitor, um, showing the depth of a snowfall on someone's shed, the size of a giant um, ceramic tiger, some kind of printer, a uh, very cute little wooden vase and some books for sale on eBay again. And this is a wine bottle also known as BS6117 showing a 1970s um, piece of German pottery. Um, a metre long or almost a metre long spring onion. 10 boxes of blackberries, the size of a pattern on a textile for sale on eBay, a giant um, cooler box, and some more unfired ceramics. And here are some photos of the original standards next to these some of these examples. When standards are developed and written, how often do they emerge later? in other unintended contexts? And what are, what are the potentials of how and where they can be used or misused? What standards have been written today or are being written today that might be reappropriated in years to come? It's an interesting thing to think about. So size giving is a people's practice, like an unwritten code, and there are no formal rules about its use. But the practice highlights a language of everyday objects that are tools, and these tools allow us to communicate in digital space today. The process of amassing this archive has led me on a journey spanning strange online worlds, including e-commerce like eBay, Etsy and Depop, discussion threads on Reddit, restaurant reviews on Yelp, scientific research communities from geologists to NASA, niche hobbyists, local history museums, model makers and mushroom foragers. These online um, territories, disciplines and practices are unified through the practice of size giving. I've also been in contact with people within these worlds to ask them more about why they use these objects and find out more about how they do things. <clears throat> For example, Leo makes his own tools um, to use in his photos. This is a golf ball on a stick that he made himself. Um, and he uses it to describe the size of his prized peonies. He's been doing this since 1997. The golf balls also allow him to communicate and configure the colour of an image. For bigger plants, he's used a basketball. Raffles Reclamation is an eBay shop selling nautical wares and furniture. And then they use a Coke can as a size giver for their images. They mark dimensions on the photograph itself, but also use the Coke can um, to illustrate the size, um, which goes to show how useless we are at imagining what 32 centimetres looks like. This Chinese props company uses a tennis ball. They use it only for their oversized objects, um, like this giant pair of vases or giant bamboo steamers to avoid any miscommunication with their customers. And this geologist and teacher on Instagram uses a Sharpie as a scaling object for anything found from found rocks to learning workshops. There are also big weather watch communities in the US who record and document pictures of hailstones, the severity of the hail going up in increments of sports ball. So this is a ping pong sized hail um, 
example, which is pretty serious, apparently. Could these communities become future standard makers? The knowledge of hobbyists could certainly provide a different type of expertise, informal, enthusiastic and international. There are so many niche conversations happening on the internet with people and people with plenty of time who are happy to geek out on the specifics of a particular question or image. They aren't members of official or um, certified organisations, but maybe it's a good thing to have diverse collective knowledge included in the making of standards. Um, I wanted to end this talk by um, looking at the importance of images. In my research, I've noticed that size givers have started to replace traditional discipline specific markers of scale online. Maybe this is because the internet addresses an international public, not only a collection of experts or researchers. Knowledge must be legible to all, especially in digital space, and measures should be common, familiar, so all can understand. In a world which is increasingly more image literate, images have become the predominant way we communicate and tell stories. This presents a in really interesting challenge for those in the business of written documents and reports. Images matter, but I'm not talking about NAF, clip art or generic stock images. What's really interesting for me is this ground up everyday practice of image making, like the woman who posts images of dolls furniture on her eBay shop to teenagers creating memes in their back gardens. This visual culture is real, weird, imperfect, spontaneous, and also very human. It describes our interaction and experience of the world. So what do standards look like in real life? What is the human experience of them? And how could this be visualized or documented? How might an ISO standard be shown and shared in a purely visual format in the age of Instagram, the internet meme? I think it's a great design brief, actually. Imagine the BSI for standard for boiling pasta reimagined as a YouTube cooking video or an instructional tutorial. I wanted to show you this video from Tom Sachs, which shows um, very clear and detailed instructions, um, but put to actions visually. When sweeping a surface, any surface, mentally divide the space into sections. Begin by sweeping one section. Concentrate on each broom stroke. Continuously refine your technique. Each broom stroke should be more effective than the stroke that came before it. When you have swept a pile approximately one half of the volume of your dustpan, carefully sweep the pile to the back of the pan. Pay particular attention to the seam between the dustpan and the swept surface. To maximize your dominion over this transition, you may need to implement a more precise broom, such as a foxtail. Properly manipulating the dustpan helps account for contour irregularities in the swept surface. Use care when disposing debris. Move your entire operation to the next unswept section. Sweep, gather, dispose, and continue. This technique will optimize your labor. Whether you're brushing off a desk in a small workshop or sweeping the surface of Mars.
So I'm going to the next slide. Um, how about an ISO standard for safety matches reimagined as an ASMR video? I don't know whether any of you know what ASMR videos are, but right now they're a obsession of a younger generation. Um, and let's play this. So I looked at one of the uh, standard specifications for matches, and in it you have some really beautiful diagrams of how to make a match. It seems to kind of really tell you this idea of the performed match lighting, um, but also the kind of textures of sound and um, visuals that um, ASMR videos show. Or how about the um, ISO standard for packaging performed as an unboxing video, for example. Um, unboxing videos are uh, YouTube videos where consumers ritualistically unbox a package and take the product out, narrating what they see in the process. So could you imagine sort of a, a standard filmed from above, um, made into a ritual and, um, and narrated very clearly and methodically? instead of written as a paragraph. So here is a photogram I made of all the size givers that are a part of my archive. Essentially, it's a never ending archive. They um, describe, well, here, are, here they are. There's a, a golf ball, a tennis ball, a baseball, a biro, a cigarette, a bottle cap, a ping pong ball, a hair clip, a matchstick, a pencil, a double A battery, a playing card, a lighter, a US cent, a UK penny, a Coke can and a paper clip. It's interesting that size givers are often objects that are becoming obsolete. Cash is replaced by contactless, Pencils and A4 are replaced by keyboards and tablets. Cigarettes give way to vapes. In the future, will the sole function of a penny become its size giving quality? Is there an object right now that will never change and always be present? And what could that object be? So that's the end. Um, and here's an invitation. Since we're all image makers now with our smartphones, I'd like you to participate in my project by contributing a photo to the archive. You can do this either in the next 10 minutes or after this talk and email it in to me um, on this email address. You're all presumably at home. You all probably have at least three size givers in your house. Find something you'd like to communicate through measurement. It could be a stack of papers, um, all the work you have on your desk, how much pasta do you have left in your coronavirus stockpile, um, a strange craft object that you've made during homeschooling, or just a pretty plant leaf. Um, any, whatever it is, place the objects together in a composition, take a photo and don't forget to caption it. It doesn't need to be beautiful, beautiful just spontaneous. You can email it to me or upload it to Instagram using the hashtag SizeGiver. Um, so I'm going to take a few minutes to um, read some of the questions um, and then I will try to answer you as best I can. I'm just going to turn off my video. Corinne, so a question from um, the audience that we've got. Um, what happens when the size gives sizes change, for example, like a Mars bar? I think that's a really interesting question, actually. And during my research, I've um, I found quite a few examples of things that have changed over time. So on eBay, I see people selling um, um, old coins next to a new coin and the old coin is a slightly different size so new coins so they're using the new coin to validate the size of the old coin if you know what i mean um or show the difference in scale i don't know i think sort of um i don't really have an answer to that i think it's uh 
yeah like how can we really is it about um is it about generations is it about the kind of generation that knew um that the size of the old mars bar um versus it, it that sort of size dimension comes to represent a kind of period of time where people knew what that particular size was and then sort of everything changes when they reconfigure the size of the mars bar and a you have to either you have to get used to it or a new generation start to kind of um understand size differently in relation to that object i don't know i think it's really really interesting how also when companies decide to um change the size of something um that's pretty established in the culture how does that change our understanding um across millions of people who interact with that object um yeah i don't know <laughs> it's something i'm sort of asking myself um within the project and having to try and sort of make categories of objects that have changed size over the years um yeah <laughs> nice question thank you um we've now got another question as well um as A2, A3, A4, et cetera, papers are part of the ISO 216, where the sheets have the same aspect ratio, um, thus aren't we introducing size ambiguity? Um, unless this is a deliberate attempt, using paper as sizing, as you don't know, uh, as you don't know, is it an A4? Yeah, definitely. I think um, that's also a similar question in a way. Um, I think it's, uh it's true um that they all look you know it's the same ratio they all look very similar so how will you really know whether it's an a4 or an a5 um and people have really played with that actually and um, particularly on this chinese meme um there was a big backlash against the the idea of the a4 waste challenge so people sort of got a3s and put them in front of their um, their bodies and said, you know, the A3 waste challenge that makes me sort of so much bigger or um, confuses you on the size of a, a body. So people sort of already subverted that meme and started to be playful with um, um, how they could uh, undo that image um, as a protest, really. Um, so that's definitely something that's happening. I think there's, it's not really a science. That's what is interesting. It's not, um, I guess what I'm proposing or sharing is, is the way that people are starting to do things through objects. And of course there are ways that they can be gamed or, um, um, so nothing is ever really certain, um, within this kind of weird new practice of objects communication. It's, uh, there are lots of ways where things are cheated or um, people are playing with those ambiguities. Um, yeah. Thank you. We've Hi. also got, got another one. Okay. Um, so the role of size givers as an internationally recognized visual reference is fascinating. Uh, do you have any views um, about the way of visually representing say magnitude or temporality impact over time? Um, I don't know, I think that's a, maybe that's a good one for me to consider after this presentation. Who, who asked this question? Um, we've got from the audience, uh, Wilson. So he's part of one of our um, committee, committee. Yeah, um, I'm, Wilson, I will get back to you on that. I'll send you um, an email. Um, have a think about um, what my response to that would be. Excellent, not a problem. So we've managed to have quite a few questions from um, yourselves, the audience. I think Corinne will take take these away and consider them and come back to you um, with her answers um, because there seems to be some really good questions and ones that I think require um, a bit more of an in-depth response. So we'd love to get back to each and every one of you and Corinne will look over these and come back to you. And as a reminder um, to the delegates, uh, once, we're, once Corinne has shared her um, picture that she has received, um, 
we will you can rejoin the plenary by clicking on the links in the agenda um because isabella will be up next um to provide her session but corinne is just uploading her image okay i have an image from can you see this yes i have an image from who is this from Do, uh, John Devaney, <laughs> how much toilet paper is left um, next to a 5p? <laughs> so that's, uh, that's one to end on. <laughs> you, you waited five minutes for it and uh, now you have um, this image of 5p as a size given next to the loo roll, which I guess is quite a, a pertinent um, topic in the age of uh, coronavirus. Um, <laughs> yeah. What a nice image to end on. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, um, I will try to uh, get back to any questions that you guys have um, uh, of the presentation and e, um, sort of sh uh, get back to you individually. Um, and if you would like to have a copy of um, my presentation, it, it actually it's the first time I've spoken about this project in public. Um, I'm working on a publication, a uh, small run of books, um, putting the catalogue together. So if anyone's interested in that, I can send on details of that. Otherwise, you can follow my project um, on um, my size giver Instagram. Um, and you can also um, contact me on my email at Goldsmiths. Thank you, Karina. That was great. Um, as Karina said, that we will come back um, to the participants that have provided the questions so that um, she will answer them accordingly. Um, please do join the main plenary now. Um, again, as I explained, um, in your join instructions are the link. Um, Isabella will be up. Thank you very much, Corinne. Thank you.